So a bit of news from 247 Sports recruiting analyst Greg Biggins, the number one player in the country in the 247 Sports composite, Corey Foreman, might be on the verge of decommitting from Clemson. Now, as I have illustrated and talked about, Clemson is still the number three team in the 2021 recruiting rankings with 10 commits and a big reason as to why their average is so high at 95.55 is Corey Foreman, which would mean that if he signed with Clemson, he would be the second straight top defensive product to sign with Clemson. Uh, last year, it was Brian Brzee who was the top non-quarterback, right, in the 2020 cycle. Foreman wants to take visits, and Clemson has a no-visit policy, and they are as ruthless about it as Mike Gundy is. For those of you that don't remember, Mike Gundy pulled an offer from a kiddo from Colony, Texas last summer because he wanted to take a visit and did to Texas Tech, all right? Dabo Sweeney lives in that same world. Once you commit to us, there are no more visits. You are a Clemson Tiger, and Foreman is interesting in that one, that dude has a Clemson tattoo on his left arm, okay? There's that. <laughs> might, might be one of those, I wouldn't have done that, maybe. But he wants to take visits to USC, among others. George is also on the list. But Clemson has a remarkable track record when it comes to holding on to commitments, right? The last time they lost a flip commitment was the 2015 class, and that was Jawan Briscoe, who was a three-star and the number 36 cornerback in the country at the time. He flipped to Georgia, right? Didn't didn't really hurt him all that much, as you can t very well see and tell. But Foreman, who has a teammate who is looking to go to USC and is very close with Gary Bryant, who's also going to USC, and Clay Helton, who has been tremendous over the last three weeks at this thing called recruiting, would love to have a Corey Foreman, and I'm sure Todd Orlando would know exactly what to do with that if he got it in his hands, right? All in the 2021 class, right? So, and I think this is particularly fascinating and interesting because I don't think that Dabo Sweeney's going to budge because Dabo Sweeney is a Jerry Krause kind of guy, meaning my system, my program is greater than any one player, specifically a guy who has never put on pads in orange and played for me. That said... Dabo has been tremendous at going to get kids from across the country, including the state of California, to come all the way to South Carolina to play for the Tigers, right? Which is not an easy thing to do. Notably, last year he also picked up DJ Ungagle, who is from St. John Bosco in California, 6'5, 253 pounds. This would be a tremendous move just to get him to reopen that recruiting because you got to believe that after that, Ohio State would be able to look over there and say, hey, look, we have the number one defensive end in the country, and Zach Sawyer committed. We have a four-star defensive end, and Tumise Adelie, who's a top 50 prospect, committed. And we have JT Tuimalel as the number one player in the 247, or number, number two player in the 247 composite, is an Ohio State lean, which means that they could end up with four <laughs> of the top five Defensive line products if they were able to, one, see a Corey Foreman decommitment and a Ohio State commitment from him, which would just be bonkers. This would be, th this would be Thanos winning in game. Forget the gauntlet. Forget snapping your fingers. Forget getting the soul stone. This would be it, right? We have never seen anything like what could happen because... It's, it's usually, as Ohio State fans would see it, the way Oklahoma fans see it, us versus everybody. But quite literally right now, it is Ohio State versus everybody. Because I've never seen so many non-Ohio State fans pull for Washington in my life. Because Washington has two in-state products, in Emeka Ubuka and JT, who I just talked about, who they need to land. And this is Jimmy Lake's first year. And the thing that Jimmy Lake puts his hat on is defense. That's the reason that we all know his name. And then when Chris Peterson steps down, they immediately elevate Jimmy. And Jimmy was kept on with this idea that if Chris Peterson were ever to go somewhere, this is your job. And he turned down other opportunities at other programs, notably like Alabama and Georgia and the like, so that he could take over this program when the time came. Now that you're losing Jacob Eason, right? But you also 
have Sam Heward in the boat, who was one of the top quarterbacks in the land. And you also have returned this tremendous defensive front. And I was thinking about this yesterday because uh, the Stanford Cardinal and the Huskies were playing on TV in a replay. And I'm a sucker for replayed college football games. I, I could care less about replayed NFL games. I just, I just don't care. But I'll watch a replayed college football game, specifically one that is last uh, that's happened in the last five years, because I learned something. And those kids are still playing for the most part, either at the next level or they're coming into their own and they're taking over programs. So I learned something from watching Jordan Scarlett like yesterday. I learned something from watching Jimmy Lake call the defense. And I'm thinking, man, he would be so good if he could get just one or two guys to help him force that front into that upper level. Because Oregon is coming after them. Oregon is going to have one of the better defenses on talent that we've seen in several years. With Justin Flo, Kayvon Thibodeau, Dante Manning. They also returned a bevy of talent from last year's Rose Bowl squad. To say nothing of what they might look like offensively. But I think that defense is going to carry them. So they're going to need firepower over there with the Washington Huskies. Just to come out of the Pac-12 North. Because right now, I kind of pencil in Oregon as the Pac-12 champ with perhaps a championship game against Arizona State, who I expect to be really, really good, not just next year, but in the coming years, especially if Jaden Daniels gets to be better and better, and they were able to pick off Boise State's offensive coordinator, and that was that was a big get for Herm Edwards, as he's able to elevate Marvin Lewis to co-defense coordinator, and Antonio Pierce is just out there recruiting his, his tail off, and they're in the talent-rich area of Arizona. I think this is all fascinating, right? Because we've never seen Ohio State do what Ohio State is doing. They are going to challenge 2010 Florida for the best recruiting class of all time. That number that they're looking to hit in the composite is 324.63 because the record right now is Florida at 324.62, right? And they had 28 commits in that class of a bunch of forgettable guys when you're looking at their production and just what Florida football was before them and what it's been after them, right? It just, it didn't act, it fizzled. And there's, there's, there's that. You could talk about this Ohio State class as one fizzling. You could also talk about them being broken up because, you know, decommitments happen. But if Corey Foreman is back on the block, even with a Clemson tattoo, it just, it, it brings in another storyline to this really interesting storyline around the pandemic. Because the dead period, which is going into month two next week, is unprecedented during this spring. And watching coaches work the phones, watching the kids talk to each other, seeing who wants to play with whom, and how Ohio State, North Carolina, USC in particular, have all been able to use this time to land commits that they probably wouldn't have landed either this soon or ever, is fascinating. And then add to that, Minnesota coming off the top rope. Minnesota picked up its first top 50 recruit in the history of the program over the weekend. I don't think that Minnesota gets a top 50 recruit if we have spring football because that kiddo probably goes somewhere else for a spring game. Just just keeping that 100 with you. I also think that looking at Maryland and what they're doing wouldn't happen if we were not in this age right now where kids don't know exactly when they're going to be able to go on official visits and they're getting to know coaches in ways that they've never had opportunities to know coaches because they ain't got nothing else to do. It ain't like they're, they got to plan practice. You know, they're not on the road. They're at home. They're Zoom conference calling with their coaches, and then they're on the phone talking to kiddos, talking to each other, talking to athletic directors, trying to answer questions, doing Zoom stuff on ESPN, talking about what college football could look like in 2020 and 2021. And all of this is tremendously fascinating because we've never seen it. And I choose to try to find these storylines because it's easy to get bogged down in how things suck. I mean, the price of oil is a negative number. But that's, I mean, that's not fun. This is fun. And I'm glad that Corey Foreman is even thinking about decommitting so that Greg Biggins can write about it. Because frankly, uh, it's it's the most fun I'm going to have all day. (laughs) Is being like, okay, watch Clemson fans go to DEFCON 1. Because they'll be the first to tell you, hey, we can do without the number one player in this class. It's fine. We got the number one player uh, in, in last year. Well, they got the number two and number three player in last year's class, so they're fine. But, you know, everybody's itching, and everybody's going to take an opportunity to stick it to Clemson because Clemson is new money, and nobody likes new money in college football. 
we come back, Mayberry and I are going to talk about these interesting facts around NFL draft dudes, and we're going to talk with Jordan Johnson, a Wasser strength coach, about what he is doing to try to help his kids stay in shape for football whenever football returns. <laughs> 